Pencil Kings, 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 Pencil Kings. Above all, draw and paint good, and something's going to happen. Welcome back. Today, we're going to talk with Francis Vallejo. Now, one of the very first podcasts that I recorded, it's actually episode 15 was with Francis. And I was just listening to this. And it's funny to go back and look at your past work and kind of see where you came from. Because obviously, that was about two years, maybe even longer than two years ago. And so recently, we are doing another batch of courses to um, populate the private library that we have inside Pencil Kings. And so I reached out to Francis. He's done some of the best, most popular courses that we have inside. And he said he's too busy, which is fine. You know, people are busy. And then I remember that he, I forget if we talked about it on the podcast or if it was just maybe an email or what it was, but he had mentioned that he was working on this book and he was going to take a year on it. And when he said that to me, I kind of, I, it just felt weird that you would work on a book for a whole year. I mean, for, for better, for worse, the, no judgment there. Just, I remember that when you said that, that that struck out as being weird to me. So um, when I, you know, you told me that you were too busy to create any more courses, I remember that book and I just asked like, how did the book go? And then you told me that it had changed your life. And that at that point I was like, okay, let's get Francis back on the podcast <laughs> and hear that story because anytime somebody says that something has changed their life, I'm, I'm just instantly curious, you know, what, what's, what's happened. And so I think it's a great um, catch up point. So welcome to the call, Francis, um, just to give people in case they haven't gone back into the archives and listened to those early episodes, why don't you give them just a one minute overview of, of kind of like who you are and what kind of art you do. And then we'll dive into the story of this book that's changed your life. Right on. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me again. So I'm Francis Vallejo. If you're over 30, you might be asking yourself, is he related to Boris Vallejo? If <laughs> uh, if you're under 30, that doesn't mean as much to you. So I'm, I'm not related to Boris. <laughs> but I'm an illustrator uh, out of Detroit, Michigan. And I, as of now, which is different than when I first uh, spoke to you, Mitch, um, now I'm a picture book illustrator. When I originally was on the podcast, I was in like four or five different genres at once, or genres of illustration. Um, I like to say my work is in the aesthetic of, say, the Norman Rockwells and Robert Fawcett's, the narrative tradition of those folks with a heavy interest in experimentation and mixed media. And uh, I really emphasize good, strong drawing, I would like to say, in my work. Awesome. Okay, well, let's just dive into, let's hear about the book. What was the book? You showed me the cover. What was it? Who was it for? And, and what role did you play in the creation of it? Sure. So the book is called Jazz Day. It came out this past March, so almost a year ago. That's crazy. Uh, it's published by Candlewick Press and written by Roxanne Orgill. When we initially spoke, I may have not had a clear vision of how long it was going to take. It actually took three years from earliest uh, contract negotiation to final mark on my final painting. So it was a really, really long process. Um, it, what it, the story is nonfiction prose and I did about 20 mixed media paintings, all pretty large, about 20 by, by 30. And, uh, this past year, like you alluded to has been pretty wild because this was my first book and I didn't know what the heck I was doing, but it's, it's been super exciting. Yeah, three years. See, like obviously you're doing other things, but – and I know that it's not just your project. There's a lot of projects that take a really long time, but it just kind of blows my mind when you think about, you know, as an adult, let's say from age 20, your working years, maybe like 20 to 70, something like that. Yeah. So you got 50 years and you took three of them to, to on one one project. What, to, what, what made it take so long? I, that, that's super true to me. And I say that because when when we spoke, I was just starting the project um, and I was kind of frustrated with deadlines because a lot of genres of illustration from storyboards to editorial and such have really, really quick deadlines and your style 
a process is going to be a result of that. And I built a process that accommodated those quick deadlines. But I was always a little unfulfilled because I wanted to get into the nitty gritty. You know, my, my guy is Norman Rockwell. That's, you know, a big influence. And he would spend one, two, three months on a piece. And I like that. I like to get into heavy research to work with models and to visit the location I'm illustrating and, and all of that. So I always had this desire to work a long time on a piece and I just hadn't found the genre to allow me to do it. So when Candlewick first gave me the the, um, the transcript, I, I read it over, I, I agreed to do it and they asked me an eternal question. Uh, they said, how long do you need to do it? And I was like, whoa, that's different. I've never been asked that before. Usually it's like we need it yesterday. So I said, well, you know, two and a half, three years. And they said, OK, you know, they didn't seem too concerned with that comment. And I just lucked out because not all publishers are like that. Candlewick is exceptional. Um, so that allowed me to visit New York and photograph 17 different models and to do full on painted color studies and full variations of value studies and to spend you know quite a bit of time on the final paintings really finesse it and and so on and so forth and i like to look and make a lot of parallels between the music industry and and illustration and i consider the creation and the rollout of an album to be similar to that of a book and you see some of your favorite musicians uh spend two three years on a project that's pretty normal and it makes sense to me to, to do the same with my, my book project, and I think it, it paid off. Just the only thing I want to say towards that, um, to wrap up that thought, though, is financially that was a big risk because a lot of children's book art is, is simple, and it's smart because if you can do simple art that's a little faster, so say that artist, uh, theoretically, say they got $50,000, but they can do two books in a year. You know, they're going to pull a hundred and I take three years and get that same 50,000. So I'm only getting, you know, 50 divided by three, um, which is a financial risk, but it could potentially have a last lasting effect. So I was aware going into it that that'd be, you know, something I'd have to deal with. And that risk did pay off for sure. Okay. I, I think that's a really interesting way to look at it. And one that I've never, I think I, I come from more of the school of thought where you know, get as much done as you can as quickly as you can and always try to be more efficient. But I can really see how if you put it all on the line on one project, that that gives you a chance to stand out and really make a name for for yourself. Whereas when you're going in that, you know, sort of efficiency model, it's you'll always have a spot in a studio because studios prize efficiency. Right. But, you know, are you proud of your work? I, I don't know. So I think it's it's a really interesting approach. So I got to ask the big question: How did this book change your life? I'm sure it touched it in many ways, but I I feel like you had one specific thing maybe that in mind that that changed it in more in in a more significant way than anything else. Well, it it definitely did. And when I started this project, I was in Sarasota, Florida, and I was not teaching very much. I was mostly surviving off my freelance and. I was struggling in the sense of finding clients that would allow me to do the work I wanted. I was fortunate to be receiving clients, but at that time, a lot of it was in um, storyboard and, and uh, comics. And those deadlines, as anyone in those industries knows, are just so fast. They're brutal. It's what you're talking about. you got to be very efficient, communicate the idea, and, and move on. And that's not to say there's not artistic flair there, but uh, it's just it was really fast. And that wasn't matching with matching with my personality and my vision for what I wanted my career to to go towards. Um, just, I, I was I look at a lot of artists like um, like Galucho and, and George Pratt and Norman Rockwell and say some of the classics like Zorn and, and all those guys and they would really get into the meat of a project over years. That was normal. So I didn't plan to get into books. I I um, stumbled into it. Kendallick actually reached out. Um, to me from a piece that I had did a couple years earlier and asked if I wanted to work in books. And so I, that was a little random. And I says, yeah, that sounds, that sounds great. So fast forward three years and I've a hundred percent identified publishing and books as the industry that fits me. It's fantastic. I love the people. 
I love uh, the deadlines, the the content, classic literature and literature in general. I've always been a book nerd. So it's big personally in that I found the genre for me. Uh, it took me about eight years to be able to say that, but you know that was my, my path. So that clarity in where to take my career is huge. Um, also, the financial and stability that have the financial benefits and the stability that have resulted from the book being released have been really great because, you know, I was just getting by for many years, just searching, soul searching. And now I have a base to build on and, you know, to save dollars, which is important. I got loans to pay off. Uh, and just to know my place in art I, again is, is, is so important. So I, I would say those are some of the, the main things. And now having established that, I can pursue things with a clarity and sort of the sky's the limit. And I'm, I'm super, super pumped for it. Can you ex expand on that idea a little bit to know your place in art? I think that was a really interesting choice of words because I – how to say this? I feel like a lot of people are out there looking for something and they don't know – what to grab onto, what kind of art to produce, who to work with, how to work, what their schedule should be, all this. There's so many questions right. and art is so diverse. Like you can take it in so many different directions that it's really difficult to know what that thing is that you should be doing. Do you feel like this was kind of just happenstance? Like it was almost luck, like rolling the dice that you just kept working and, and you know, eventually you kept working and you knew yourself, you knew what you liked or didn't like. Uh, maybe you didn't know exactly that literature would be the place for you, um, but you just kept going and then it just happened for you. Or do you think it was more a little bit more deliberate? Well, I, I will say that I teach uh, at the College for Creative Studies in Detroit, and I teach the senior class. So the conversation about which genre of art matches your personality and your aspirations is, is a big one that I have all the time. But uh, for me, it, it was happenstance in that um, this, you know, Candlewick reached out to me, but I think I had the the mentality that I was just going to try as many different types of art as I could. And I've given a lot of a lot of presentations and, and public speaking, you know, now, and uh, talking to a lot of young and older students, and that's what I say because you know you could get an opportunity early in your career, and that could be the exact right one for you or the exact wrong one, and you have to keep keep you know your options open for all sorts of different opportunities. And I think for me, I didn't find publishing. It found me, but I had the mentality that I was going to try anything. And eventually I definitely knew it when it hit me that I was ready to embrace it. And, and it was, it was the right move. But you know, my, my advice to anybody is you have your vision of what you want to do with your art and pursue that aggressively. But the reality of a lot of industries is sometimes many quite different than sort of what you think. It's either going to be more romantic or unromantic. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you need to have that conversation with somebody. If you forever want to be a storyboard artist, learn the art of storyboarding, but talk to storyboard artists and say, but what's the real deal, man? Hit me, hit me with the real talk. How does it, the lifestyle of a, uh, a storyboard artist like? Because even though we want to just grind out our art all the time, we have to live as artists and we want to be happy with that lifestyle. And uh, to find that, I think, is something you have to fight for. And you might not find it right away. It took me eight years, but uh, I finally found it. I just had this huge smile on my face at the comment of romantic or not romantic. And because I had the, you know, a lot of the things that, that I did in video games, I feel like when you're playing the game, you're like so fascinated by making things. And then when you get into the reality, you're just like, hey, wait, where's the magic here? And the magic was always in the friendships for me. The people that I work with are really dedicated and they're fun to be around. But I feel like for you, uh, it, it's romantic being in literature. Is it? Is that right? I think so. I think so. Um, picture books and, and in the literature business, uh, there's a academic – quality to it, a, a bleed for your art, for better or for worse sort of culture. Uh, 
you know, the, the ability for me to say, you know, I need to go to Jamaica to research this project and the publisher will be like, cool. And I need 17 models. Could you cover the, um, the expense to hire these models? And they'll say, cool. Um, because they know that these, these books, they could be timeless pieces of art that are going to exist for a long time. And of course that happens in a lot of other genres, but, um, I enjoy in literature, the, the, um, heaviness and the respect this product, this book has, and, and you can really flex your, your artistic vision in an inspiring way in it. And I, and I love that. And I've always been a romantic artist. Um, you know, I was the kid in art school covered in paint and, uh, you know, brought 19 new artists I discovered that week and, and all this thing. And I, I seen the life of Sargent and he'd work from, you know, Western light for three hours at a time. And then he'd go landscape painting and then he'd go like do all these other things and go travel and stuff. That romantic vision of, you know, the art life and, um, it's not necessarily all that glory all the time, but it has pieces of that, and, and I love it. So where do you go from here? Like where – what's the next step? You you realize that you're uh, – you, you found the place where you want to be, at least for the current period of time. Uh, you're teaching at, at the school, uh-huh. and what's, what's next? So that's the big question. Uh, I've loved in all of my classes to track – my decision pretty close just because I think I've spent my whole career trying to get to this point where I have a lot of options uh, and I think my students are gonna you know potentially benefit from where I take it from here and I don't know where it's gonna go but I'll sort of tell you where I'm at now so the the book came out and it's done pretty well the reason that I haven't signed on to a new project is in academia an undergraduate especially in graduate, a lot of art schools want you to have uh, a master's. And I've struggled to build in those classes into my schedule because I can get fairly busy. So I've taken classes on and off. So I'm trying to just grind out this degree um, so that I can really focus on my freelance along with with my teaching. So you can imagine teaching full-time, being a student full-time, and then taking on a, a massive book project could be tricky. So... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really taking my time to pick the right one. So, you know, I have a few publishers that are interested in, in some projects. Um, and then I have publisher interest in pitching a project. Um, one of the directions is working with a writer that I've identified personally um, or writing it myself and, um, and, and illustrating it myself. So, you know, I'm reviewing manuscripts, uh, really negotiating budget as well as length of time because length of time actually is is a big deal um so i'm in the midst of that right now it started right like the first of january i've started to entertain all of these these options and hopefully by june and i'm going to take my time i'll sort of lock into something and and start that process so we'll we'll see and all of all of the options are are different they're all going to involve going somewhere to research it you know one's potentially in london i got this other one potentially in jamaica um, so that's the fun part because then if I sign on in the summertime, then come August ish, uh, I would go visit those locales to really just get into the nitty gritty of the research. I like how you're, you don't have this sense of, of rush or speed or need to be somewhere like you're just taking it as it is. Have you always been like that? Or is this something that you consciously remind yourself to just slow things down and, and just keep, you know, keep moving forward, but you don't have to be in a rush. I think people that know me would say I'm pretty, pretty chill guy. Um, re- reasonably, I mean, I get stressed out like anybody else, but uh, I try not to let things out of my control stress me out. Um, and if I can have a project and I can get a long time on it, I'm going to do that because I know that'll cause me less stress and I can just do the best job possible. Uh, it was a big deal when I was in school to be aware of this one artist, um, Antonio Lopez Garcia, and I, I probably discovered him my junior year, and he would do these massive landscapes, and I would look at the credits, and it would say oil painting, painting of Madrid, I'm 
not sure the exact location, but somewhere in Europe, um, 1972 to 1984. And I love these paintings, so I needed to analyze why did I love them so much. And there was the history in the artwork. He didn't nail it the first time. He didn't nail it the 100th time. He might have nailed it the 300th time. And he kept building the history. And, you know, there's, there's certain artists that say the amount of time you spend and invest in a piece is uh, realistically the amount of time you can expect your audience to invest in it. And I don't know if I agree in that or not, but there's some romanticism in there. So, you know, really digging in and making work over time, I think – there's a space for that, and I've, I enjoy that idea, and I've, I've arrived there. So who knows? I mean, I spent three years on a book. What would happen if I spent eight? You know, that, that could be exciting, and uh, I think the work that would be a result of that, I wouldn't feel guilty I didn't put out a ton as long as what I do put out is, is strong. So, yeah, you know, that's I guess that's where my head's at about it on it right now. Yeah, I wanted to ask because it's a realization that I've had recently going back in and studying uh, traditional drawing about how uh, like how good your results can be when you just really take the time. And I feel like that's something that in getting caught up with getting into the entertainment industry, there's not time, there's the opposite of time. Yeah. There's like you're saying, you know, it needs to be done yesterday. And it's really nice to go back to that. And I think for, you know, somebody who's listening you might, if you feel like you're always rushed with your art, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. You could, you know, block off instead of doing 10 one hour pieces, you could do one 10 hour piece or you could stretch, you know, you can play with the time scales. Yeah. But I, th I think it's a really interesting idea, time and, and then what that does to your art. Well, I, I agree. And you're in control of your own destiny. And as commercial artists, illustrators, whether it's in games or freelance or what have you, the commercial world is fast paced, basically, um, but you don't have to submit to that. If some people love it, some people don't, and if you don't love it, find the avenue that allows you to take your time. It exists, you know. So, uh, I agree for sure. So, I want to ask what happens once you put out a book that's really well received, because I have no. I have no um, data points, right? I, I, data points is the wrong word. It's very corporate. But uh, yeah. I don't know what it's like inside uh, that industry. And I think it's really exciting when you have that first breakthrough moment, which I think, you know, getting the book published and having it well received w would be a moment like that. Yeah. What happens directly after that? Is your phone ringing? Are people emailing you? Is it, or is it like no one's emailing you except your mom? It's like good job, you know. What what happens? You go from weird introvert in the studio for three years to ultra extrovert. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I was doing a lot of reading at libraries, presentations, lectures, uh, in an effort. One, I want to get my book out to people, and I really enjoyed you know, seeing their response to my, my work I've spent so long on. Um, and, and two, just to become part of the, the community, you know, libraries are the, are so important and they, they don't run it, but they curate the literature culture, the distribution of, of writing and books to the masses basically. Um, so, you know, a lot of interactions with them, um, you know, I have agents approach me, and I haven't signed on to one. Um, publishers expressing interest—that's that's you know happened for sure. But the the big thing though was just the amount of effort and energies in getting the book in front of people. And certain times that got a little overwhelming. Like man, I, I forgot that I'm an artist. I actually draw pictures instead of talk about drawing pictures. Um, but it was it was exciting at the same time, and the amount of people I met was substantial. Uh, you know, when I was young, I had certain artists that had a huge impact in my life. And I'm not saying that I'm doing that to these young, young people, but I think I have the ability to potentially do that. And I take that real serious and I've gotten nice feedback from presentations I've done and really, you know, introverted, quiet students that are amazing artists. And they're maybe eight and, the, and their parents are like, you know, I don't know, is art a real job? And I can be the person to say, yeah, it actually is. I was your eight-year-old. You know, I'm 31 now, but, you know, there's there's a future in that. And that, that ability was really exciting. Um, but it, it definitely the social aspect, the presentation aspect, it's sort of the third 
the the third part of book creation also if I can go there is that when I started the book I always remembered what Jillian Tamaki fantastic illustrator said she said you have the research stage you have the production stage basically of the final artwork and then you have the promotion stage the release the rollout and each one is as important as the other and with that in mind I'm like all right I worked really hard on this art. I'm going to work really hard on, on the promo and the, and the release. Um, because I was a new artist, uh, the new guy on the block, the publisher was great in promoting it, but I was an unproven asset to them. So they did um, a, a okay amount on their own. And when I say okay, I mean I wasn't you know, a, a Harry Potter. Right. They're not going to put the money Harry Potter had behind it with this new Vallejo guy. And that makes total sense. And I would have done the same thing. Um, so I went out of my way to do a lot of promoting and to make an Amazon author account and a library thing account and a Goodreads account and make a Skype in the cl classroom account and all this stuff. And to reach out to people and, and all these things that more well-known authors, the publishers may do that for them. So I took it upon myself to do that on my own and, and it, paid off pretty well so all of that I didn't know what I was doing but now having gone through it this time uh, I'm ready to just attack it next time I have that opportunity it was it was really exciting oh that's great and I think it you know in a lot of projects it really comes down to I, I see a lot of people put in the work but when it comes to promotion and I've been guilty of this as well it's just you know you put it out and expect that it will happen on its own you know you put in all this work you know, aren't people going to notice? And people will notice, but not as many people if you if you start actively showing it to people. I think it's great that you took that on yourself. Yeah, it was. I didn't necessarily know what I was doing, but I, that's that was cool. You know, I, I had weird approaches to certain things. I got a talk coming up in a month at the Michigan Library Association. I think I'm going to start it with a. Uh, a hip hop song. So <laughs> we'll see how that goes, but I, I like that. It's, it's, I keep it informal. That's kind of exciting. That's kind of fun. So I'm curious about how this all came about. You said that, you know, you're working freelance, uh, you're doing some courses for pencil Kings. You were teaching for other people. There's a lot of stuff going on. You're studying a lot. Why, why you like for, for other people who are in a similar situation where they're they're they haven't found their groove yet. Um, was it really just randomly that they found you and why did they want to take a chance on you and, and give you three years to do the project? Like these are things that to me seem like they don't, don't quite add up. Like obviously it, it did because the book is out and everything is finished, but I'm wondering if there's anything that we can get that could be helpful for somebody who's in that same position as you were, uh, you know, a couple of years ago before you started this project um, you know, if it's getting noticed or if you're doing something special there to get noticed by publishers or, um, yeah, I, I, I don't even know what the right questions to ask. I hope you, yeah. you can understand what I'm trying to get at here. You know, I've tried to analyze it too, because, um, as an educator, I can't just tell people, well, try really hard and try really hard. Doesn't mean anything. You kind of, you want to have, give concrete responses. And the reality is that, you know, my, the publisher, hires someone and I forget the title but they search out new talent um, and contact them for potential new projects and this individual googled I think jazz illustrator or illustration and my art was somehow at the top of Google and they reached out and then three and a half years later I'm um, you know things are working out pretty well in the publishing industry so that's obviously that's not actionable Right, like you just can't sit there and hope. I kind of think it is actually. You know what? I and and just just uh, go with me for a second here. So, uh, ten years ago, uh, when I had uh, my very first website, it was called Drawing Coach. It's still up. There's a lot of old drawings there. Um, I really got into search engine optimization. So my key phrases would come up for, or my images would come up for like how to draw an ear and you would see my picture of an ear, how to draw like if you Googled cartoon tu turtle, my picture would come up. And that cartoon turtle, which is a bit of a tongue twister, I had so many requests of people wanting to use it to, to like – you know, loosely license it. They're like, hey, can I use this for my softball team? Can I use this for this? I want to use this in my report. And so I think there's something there of uh, having search engine optimization um, 
and looking into it so that your images are tagged properly and then choosing a, a, a niche or a niche, depending on how you say it. Um, I forget his name right now, but we had him on the podcast and it was a friend of yours, an illustrator who was going in and doing a lot of baseball work. And oh, yeah. um, I think he was designing hats as well. Do you, Oliver, Doming- do you know? Oliver Dominguez. Yeah. Yeah, Oliver. And I think it could have been a similar thing there where he was putting up baseball pictures uh, for a certain time period. And then people found him for this sort of like uh, romantic view of what baseball is. So I think there's something actually there that's really powerful in um, being aware that of of going after a a specific topic. Like if you're just doing random studies, it's not this advice isn't going to help you. But if you're going after a specific topic, um, be aware of search engine optimization because it's something that – you know, it does work. You, 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 you were found basically, you know, I, I don't know if you were trying to be found for search terms, but, uh, th- this is part of it. Well, I've, I've thought of that too. And there is something there for sure, because if you look at my, my professional life, the first four years I was, I was just a, a barbarian as far as posting my art online. Like I, every new thing popped up, blog spot, Twitter, Facebook, every forum I was hitting it to the the effect of maybe like 20, 30 hours a week. I was just putting my stuff out there. Um, eventually I super burn out and about the last four years I've been really quiet on social media, but, um, towards the, the end of what you're talking about, uh, I do think that I saturated the internet so much with my content at that time that it's still pretty well represented online. Um, Mm-hmm. A lot of people know me from that time, and I do think that did have a result. And I don't think I would have gotten this book if I hadn't posted my stuff so much at that time. And I'm I'm careful to say that, not necessarily as a, as advice. It's more like a case study. This could happen. I don't want anyone to translate mm-hmm. this as you have to post like that. Like that shouldn't be in your top three things to do. I think. Um, but if you enjoy the social media aspect, that can work to your benefit. And in, in that case, for sure, I, I'm, I'm really positive that's how they discovered my image and why Google had it at the top. Um, I've sort of changed mm-hmm. my stance, but if anything, I, I think um, I, I think that 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 helped. And yeah, I, I could go on forever on that. It's interesting, but my my mentality on social media is, is so different now. Okay, so that that's how you got discovered. And then was there something like when they uh, – I don't know if it would be like a talent scout or a new talent development, what that person would be called that, that reached out to you. Was there something that you did in the interview that like gave them confidence in what you were doing? Because I feel like for me talking to you and the few times that we've talked, I feel like you you care so deeply about art and, and the history behind it and the research behind it. And so that gives me a ton of confidence. Um, but do you think there was something that in the interview or in the, I, and I don't even know what the process is that allowed you to, to dictate terms a little bit in term so that you could make the project fit you? Um, to specifically answer your question, they just took a risk. You know, they had me read it. I agreed to do it, sign contracts and bam, we were into it. So, um, not necessarily in that. I mean, I think I handled myself professionally, but it wasn't anything exceptional, but um, there, there were a couple circumstances that I, I think were game changers. Um, so but between the thumbnails and the tight sketches, I really emphasized that I, I wanted to go to New York and they helped cover that. And it, to their credit, they said, well, you know, you're going to be in New York, you know, Boston isn't too far. So we, that's where they're located. That's where the publisher's at. Um, would you be interested in pitching your thumbs in person? And I, I was nervous, but I said, yeah, yeah, definitely. That'd be great. So I, I did. And, you know, I, I, I think I handled myself and I was pretty personable and, and I really did try to communicate my passion. There's one film by, um, it's called Yodorowsky's Dune. And it talks about how Alejandro Yodorowsky pitched dunes around Hollywood. And I always took away the passion in his pitches. That's really important. So I tried to communicate that through how I talked about my thumbs and that in-person connection to the 
you know, the editor of the whole publisher and my art directors and all the other millions of people that work there, I think left a good impression. So they felt even more confident in supporting my project. And there was another time that I could have uh, mailed my work, but I work so damn hard on this thing. I'm like, I'm going to make this an event. So I, um, I did mail my work, but I picked it up in Boston in person and uh, hand delivered it to them. And there was a big meeting and everyone came around and my art was huge and they put it all over the wall. Sort of the studio stopped and I talked about it and they shot video. And both of those things was like a one, two punch. Like we should support this guy. You know, he, he believes in this so much that I think we should believe in it too. And I could have not done those things and the book still had have done okay. But I think as a result of both of those in-person experiences was a big part of, of why the book did pretty okay, you know, after, after it was released. And that was important. And I, I learned that. So now if I ever have the opportunity to do anything in person, whether it's an inconvenience of travel or whatever, I'm going to always do it. Cause that's, that's big, especially in an era of, um, not being face to face, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I, I agree. Whenever you can meet people or it's, it's just so much better. And uh, like for the, the artists that we're often talking with, I keep telling them that they aspire to work at Pixar and Disney, and, and that's great. But your first job is probably going to come from somebody local that you meet in person, and they can size you up, you know, in person. And be like, yeah, I want this person working in my studio or my office or whatever it is, um, and they can trust you. And it's all virtual; you have no clue. Yep, for sure. Well, I don't want to run too long, but uh, any last words that uh, you could give somebody that might be trying to go down a similar road to? I think the big thing is, man, if we could just find a way that could connect people with their passion so they know what it is, that would just be so revolutionary. And I, I have no idea how we could do that without, you know, some kind of neurological matrixy, you know, inv invasive thing. But um, maybe have some like words of wisdom for people who are on that path yeah. and, and still kind of fumbling around. Not Not necessarily that you were, but they haven't found that place where they feel home or they're like, this is where I need to be right now. I mean, I teach a class around that and I'll, I'll tell you this. So I think it's twofold. One is people are trying to find their voice as an artist, their personal style, if you will. Another one is then to find the industry that allows you to express that. So I think to find your style and I'm stealing this from Jane Radstrom, um, fantastic artist, check her out. Um, she said that your style is a result of an art artist from art history. Um, an artist, a contemporary artist, and something outside of art that you're interested in. So that could potentially be Rembrandt, uh, James Jean, and unicorns. Like those are your things. And then you smash those mm -hmm. into a blender and your genuine style comes from that. So I think that that was really big and that helps someone find their style. So if you've done that, that's a, that's a big deal. And of course, it's not that simple, but I think it's sort of a nice formula. Um, so then... You know, you have to really assess your personality and the routes and the options available to you. And I've broken that down into you can potentially go freelance, and that has a million definitions, um, but freelance and studio. So if you can break it down just to those two routes, and I'm sure people will disagree or, you know, what, what have you, but this works for me. Um, the freelance person is going to embrace the hustle and the lack of for security uh, but mm -hmm. really enjoy the entrepreneurial spirit and going to things and meeting people and sort of controlling controlling their life to the utmost they're gonna like that um, and that's something that that they have in them um, then you have the person that may go to a studio and you know the studio provides you know security reasonably um, and not as much artistic uh, options, especially up front. You got to pay your dues a little bit more, um, and that's totally fine. So if you got to identify where does your personality sit with that, and if I have a student that um, never takes my advice to go to things or to reach out to people, they're scared to send emails and all this or that, and they tell me they want to do freelance, that's a big conversation, you know. And I'm not going to dissuade them not to, but you have to really look at yourself and say, maybe, you know, the studio is for you. Let's get, get a little footing in the studio and then maybe think freelance or, 
um, a person says they want to do freelance, but they're like, yeah, I need, I need a check every, every two weeks. It's like, well, I don't know. So that, that would sort of be my advice is to sort of look at it in, in that three headed way. You know, you got your style development and then you got the, the freelance route and then the studio route and, and see where you sit in there and above all draw and paint good and something's going to happen. I love that. That's such a good framework. What, I, I, but I want to ask one follow-up question before I let you go because I know you think so deeply about this. And that's how do you know if you're choosing the right – let's say you go with the blender method yeah. um, that Jane uh, came up with. How do you know if you're choosing the right options to come up with something that people will want to pay for? Or do you think it almost always does as long as, you're ch- as, long as you choose a contemporary artist who's getting work – that's the thing that kind of protects you and makes sure that you have a little bit of uh, sellable style in that uh, formula. Um, I mean, that's that's an awfully commercial uh, filter to it. I don't know if I I would I would say to go that route. More so, the artists have to be true to you. You have to understand which artists do you appreciate and which artists are genuinely inspiring to you and there's a humongous difference between the two because i i love bougereau i love bougereau's art but i don't want to paint like that so you know identifying really art that makes sense to you and do they like shape design or do they like line is their subject matter exciting have you researched and read their biographies and their life stories and find yourself having parallels between your life you are going to eventually really pare it down and there's going to be an artist you keep going back to in art history and for me it's uh, Zorn and Rockwell I'll pick two and contemporary I have a big list but one's George Pratt and the other one's um, Paul Pope who I've both been lucky to study with so you combine Rockwell and, and George Pratt and I love hip hop and music and then I do think you genuinely get me and, and there's not so much sort of this co- mm. this commercial um, viability that I'm thinking about as much more than the truth. And I think if your artwork is truthful to who you genuinely are, um, and you have the understanding, it is still a commercial thing and you need to get in front of people and and do your hustle and, and, and your networking, then you'll be okay. Um, in, in, in my head. So that's sort of how I would pare that, that stuff down. Um, but it takes uh, an incredible amount of self-awareness and introspection and research required from it. So if if the, if you're willing to do that and you should be because you love art and no one can dissuade you not to do it, then you will come to that whether it takes two years or like Andrew Hamm always seemed to have like a pretty clear route and I'm sure he didn't. He had his struggles, but he it seemed like he found his aesthetic sophomore year. For me, I'm just getting a hold on what my art looks like. So it could take you a while, but as long as that truthfulness guides you, you should be should be good, you know. Awesome. Well, Francis, no matter where, you know, which project you end up taking, um, please do keep us in the loop and let us know. Let us know how it turns out, even if it's eight years. I mean, I'd love to have you back on the podcast kind of like on a yearly basis if that's, you know, because I'm sure there's interesting things happening along that process. And uh, I really appreciate how deeply you're able to speak about this. I wish I had the same, uh, I don't know, same ability to, to understand this stuff. Well, I think I gave some pretty long answers, so sorry if I got a little long-winded there. No, it was great, and, and I re- really appreciate it, and I'm sure the uh, the audience appreciates it as well. So where can people um, go to get the book, and where can they find you online? Two last questions, and then we're done. Sure. I, also, I don't think I ever actually mentioned what the book's about. It's 1958 Jazz in Harlem and the creation of a fa- famous um, photo of all the, some of the biggest jazz musicians, and it goes through their bios and – and these kids, these rascally kids getting in trouble. So that's what the book's about. It's called Jazz Day. You can get it at most Barnes and Nobles. I think it's at some Costco's. Um, but you can pick it up on Amazon. So that's Jazz Day, written by Roxanne Orgill and illustrated by, by me. Um, you can find me online at my name, Francis Vallejo. I'm sure you can see that in the info on this post. And uh, last thing I'll say is, you know, I've, I've struggled in, in this journey like anybody else, and if I can help you struggle a little less, I'd be happy to. So if anyone listening wants to shoot me an email, um, do so. You know, my contact's on my website, and I'd be happy to take a look at your work or offer some advice. So feel free to take me up on it. 
Awesome. And Franz has dropped a ton of references in this. So uh, we'll go and have links to relevant posts and stuff uh, over at pencilkings.com slash podcast, as well as link, links to Francis's site. So if you want an easy to remember place, you can go there. Uh, thanks so much, Francis. I really appreciate it. And I wish you all the best with the next project. Thank you, Mitch. Thanks for having me. Good demand patience, skill, years of practice. Ah, you talk like a fool. I would trade a century of practice for an ounce of inspiration.